It's an, or, an epic orchestral introduction for what is going to be an epic night. I'm not joking when I say that I could count on one hand the number of people who have influenced the way that I think as deeply as my guest tonight has influenced the way that I think. Whether that's a, a compliment or not, I leave to you. My haters, of course, are going to decide that that's a, a terrible slur against the man. Uh, I consider him to be uh, a borderline genius, and he's not going to be comfortable with me saying that, but he's, he's sitting there in the green room right now. He has to listen. He can't reply, so I'm going to make him as uncomfortable as possible. Um, that I, The way that he explains this concept of virtuous corruption and applies it into the realm of science. And in this case, in, in the case of his book, uh, which I bought, I think it's some 10, nine, 10 years ago, something like that, uh, Professor Ainsley Kello, Science and Public Policy, The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Science. This is a book worth the price of entry. And I say that knowing very well that if you were to jump on Amazon right now, you'd be paying nigh on $200 to get a copy and to get it delivered. So uh, this is our guest tonight. It's, uh, it's going to be a phenomenal slow chat. Now, I am a, a father and a husband and a father of two children. Thank you very much, Winston. And um, our evening routine ran a little late. So my dessert is literally arriving with me right now as I start the show. So I've got some apple pie and some cream. And I've got a puppy dog here to show you. For those of you that haven't seen Emmett live, this is Winston. This is my boy, Winston. Hi. And this is Emmett. Emmett joined the family just last week. So say hello to Emmett, everybody. Say hello. Hi. All right, off you go. Hi. Off you go. Thank you. Hold him. All right. So please don't mind me. In addition to the usual uh, having a sip of whiskey tonight, I have the Bunnerhaven. Uh, this is their helmsman. Lovely, lovely drop. I rate this very, very highly. If anyone's looking for a gift idea, that's a good place to start. The Bunnerhaven helmsman, uh, and of course, some black tea. Uh, and I've look, I'm off the cigars at the moment. I do still enjoy my cigars, but I'm not doing the slow chats with the cigars. I've had to move inside. It's the middle of winter. It's too cold to be outside, but I'm going to have some lovely dessert. So you're going to have to forgive me as I enjoy that as we go on. Now, there's just a couple of formalities I need to get through before we do get started. I see your comments coming in. Uh, good evening, Bruno. Thank you for being here. Karen, absolute pleasure. Thank you for being here. Tanya, uh, thank you for being here. And uh, okay, so we have someone check out goodsnavigator.com. Um, send me a message to the Facebook page so that I can have a reminder of that. Chris, always a pleasure to see you. Hazel, you too. Um, Lisa, obviously reacting to seeing my beautiful face would be nothing to do with seeing Emmett the dog at all. Uh, that must be, must be me. Have the tickets sold out. I'll get to that in just a second. No, not quite. Uh, enjoy. Yes, I will. Emmett and Winston, uh, so cute. Yes, they are. Good evening. And uh, oops, Walter, there's, look, the comments have already kicked off. So you, they're all coming in too fast for me. I can't keep up with them all. Now, a couple of formalities we need to get to. I'm going to share my screen here because we've got a bit to get through. Share screen, uh, a window, sharing that one. Share. Okay, and if I come back here, yes, there we go. Okay, so I'm just going to remove this, uh, this, there we go. Okay, so I was just asked, have we sold out all of these seats for the cinema showings for Battleground Melbourne yet? No, we haven't, not quite. We have about 80 seats left at the premiere. There were nearly 500 to start with, so there's only about 80 left. If you want to be at the premiere, get in quickly. Uh, and then there are still seats available at all of the others. We've got Coringle, which is Fr uh, Frankston, basically, Werribee, Geelong, Knox, Fountain Gate, Echuca, Shepparton, Albury, Wodonga, and Morwell, and maybe adding one or two others as well. So we do have tickets available at all of them still, uh, but in some cases, the tickets are getting low. So if you do want to come along uh, and make sure that you do get into that pretty quickly, let me just chuck a link into the chat here. Uh, okay, back to comments. Uh, I'm just going to chuck a link into the chat. There we go. That is if you would like to get a ticket. Now, uh, there are a few other things we need to discuss very quickly. Firstly, does it come in pink? Yes, it does. It does now. As of yesterday, Good People Break Bad Laws t-shirts are available in pink. These were much requested about six months ago. Uh, I had some of you lovely ladies absolutely on me about where are my pink Good People Break Bad Laws t-shirts. Well, it's taken us a little while to organize. They're here now, and I will drop a link, predictably, uh, into the comments so that if that's your kind of thing, 
uh, then you can jump into that. Now, we only have 100, and certain sizes will sell out very quickly. There's literally 100. For the rest of this year, we cannot get a restock of the pink until next year. So if you want a pink Good People Break Bad Laws t-shirt, get on it now. Okay, uh, a couple of other things very quickly. Uh, I will be up in Sydney on the 25th at a thing called the Freedom Summit. Now, this, the Melbourne Freedom Summit was absolutely phenomenal. I was there. I spoke at it. Absolutely brilliant. The Sydney Freedom Summit is coming up. Uh, and let me just copy that link and drop that into the comments. Um, guys, if you're in Sydney, get to this. Melbourne Freedom Summit was genuinely amazing. I'm not just saying that. It was really, really, really phenomenal. Uh, I am also a keynote speaker at the CPAC conference, along with Zuby, Senator Jacinta Price, and so many others. Uh, I have got uh, the tickets page here. Guess what? There's another link incoming. Uh, and finally, guys, uh, uh, is it final? Oh, no, not quite finally. Almost finally. Um, Nigel Farage, who's coming over for CPAC. So if you're in Sydney, you can hear him at CPAC. If you're not in Sydney, if you're in Melbourne or in Brizzy, you can hear Nigel Farage via um, Turning Point Australia, Joel Jamal. Joel Jamal. I never know how to pronounce that. I'm not quite sure. I'll have to ask him. Um, has organized for him to be speaking at a couple of massive convention centers in Melbourne, Sydney, and Brizzy. So if you can't make it to CPAC, which I highly recommend, uh, but if you can't, then you can come to the um, Turning Point Australia Nigel Farage live event. Links are all in the comments. I've just absolutely spammed you guys with uh, comments here, but there is one more thing. I've been teasing you about coffee for the last little while, and I'm going to tease you one more time. So this is the Brew website. It is coming soon. This is going to change the face of new and alternative media in Australia. This concept, this idea, I'm modeling off some of what has been tremendously successful in the US. We have a smaller population, so we have to be a bit more strategic about how we do it. Nevertheless, the model does apply. And uh, guys, you're going to want to be a part of this. Brew coffee, you're going to be able to drink excellent specialty grade organic coffee that is going to cost you a lot less, way less than half of what you're paying right now at a cafe. And in the process, you're going to be supporting your choice of new media, freedom friendly content creator. So Go to uh, brewaustralia.com. I'm just going to post that link predictably uh, into here, brewaustralia.com. Chuck your email address in there and you will have secured your spot as one of the first 250 that are going to make this concept possible. And in the process, working with me, we are going to change the face of new media in Australia. Okay, we're done. We're done, I promise. We're done. That's it. That's it. That's all the crap. It's done. We can finally get onto the main event. And ladies and gentlemen, what a main event we have tonight. Uh, Professor Ainsley Kello, I mentioned him right at the start. For those that have joined me since then, he's the author of Science and Public Policy, The Virtuous Corruption of Virtual Environmental Science. And I am not joking when I tell you that he is one of the single most influential people in terms of the impact that he has had on how I think, on how I problem solve, on how I try and understand what is happening politically and scientifically in the world around me. This man would be among the top five most influential people on my thinking. And he joins me right now. Professor Ainsley Kello, thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you so much, Tofu. Pleased to be here. Well, that was a lengthier introduction than I intended. So I do apologize and thank you for your patience. Um, but we do have to start with a really big question that everyone is on everyone's mind right now. And that is, what are you drinking tonight? Well, I've, um, I've got a, an awful head cold and I hope my Ah. Voice last last the distance, but okay. in order to, to in order to help clear the uh, the nasal passages and the sinuses, I have the last little bit of a. Uh, a f it was fifteen years old, but uh, mm. it's considerably older now. Uh, wow! A nice Calvados from uh, from one of my tours through uh, Normandy, and I, I'm wow. convinced actually. I'm convinced actually, Normandy was chosen as the site for the invasion of World War Two. In order to secure the supplies of Calvados, um, I'm that sure that's sense. the case. That I'm sure that's sense. the case. You know, yeah, mm. of course. Um, so uh, I may well uh, inhale it more than uh, more than I drink it, uh, <laughs> but I also I also have uh, with me the trusty Geelong, the, the mighty caps uh, <sighs> container to sip from uh, some pure water. So. All, all okay. eventualities are covered. So. All eventualities. All right. Look, I've got my black tea. I've got my Bunnahabhain uh, single malt Islay whiskey. So I'm all set. I've got, of course, oh, the cheers. apple pie. 
I do apologize. Cheers indeed, actually, and and thank you. This has been a long time coming. Yeah, well, I think I first met you years ago. You you dropped by to see me. I think when you you might have been working on the on your work on the the Murray Darling Basin at the time. Look, it was either to do with the Murray-Darling Basin, because I have a funny feeling that the person who first mentioned you to me and and put me onto you would have been um, Jennifer Marahassi. Okay, probably was. uh, I believe, way back in the day. And uh, I was extensively relying on her work for some of my early, um, for actually the very first um, Murray-Darling Basin video that I ever did. So I suspect that that's the case. Now, that was 2012, Right. Literally right. ten yeah. years ago, and yeah. I, I I got this book. I paid about eighty something dollars for it at the time, which was extortionate. Yeah, um, it is. It is extortionate. Um, and unfortunate, and- they're, they're the realities of of uh, hardcover only publishing, where the intended market is really institutional libraries, and the publisher tries to recoup uh, mm-hmm. their costs uh, from that. But they did. If you go directly to the publisher's website, and it's published by Edward Elgar, they did some years ago reduce the price on their oh, website. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, and, and, it, and it's also available as an ebook. Uh, mm. So my, my apologies to your viewers for the <laughs> ex- exorbitant price. But I can assure them I, I haven't received uh, a, uh, a cent in royalties because, again, that's, that's the nature of publishing a book like this. I mean, if you, yes. want, to turn, if you want to turn a pot boiler, uh, then you might find you might find uh, a readership, and you might get some um, some royalties. I've mm. got a, a, a textbook I co-authored back from 1995 that I still get dribbles of, of uh, royalties yeah. on on environmental yeah. politics and policy making in, in Australia with Tim Doyle. But uh, other than that, you don't get a lot uh, no. from no, serious don't. serious specialised academic publishing, unfortunately. I, I was going to give you a hard time about the fact that I paid 80 some dollars for this and I'm sure you must have gotten at least six cents out of that um, <laughs> because I do understand a little bit about how the world of publishing works and uh, it certainly is not set up to favour the authors, that is for sure. So Danny's saying that he's got it as the ebook, um, just as good, I'm sure, uh, uh, in the ebook. And um, I, Ainsley, I would, I would, nothing would make me happier tonight than if you were to tell me that you're working on an update or a new edition of this. Is there any chance of that? Um, not really. I mean, since I've ret- been retired four and a half years, right. and um, I'm still writing. Uh, my most recent book is on the political organization of the mining industry at three levels okay. of governance, state, okay. federal, and, and global. And I finished that off with Marion Sims, the late Marion Sims, who unfortunately died before uh, we submitted that. Um, but... Uh, and I'm working on a book on um, uh, cl- uh, energy finance and the uh, attempt, successful attempt in the OECD of the Americans and others under the under the Obama administration to uh, to restrict finance for coal, uh, coal-fired mm. energy, mm. even in developing countries, uh, which is an interesting project. There's a lot of pieces to it. But ultimately, of course, what all they did was um, clear the field for the Chinese, and the Chinese moved in and said, "Thank you very much. We'll mm-hmm. fund, mm-hmm. we'll fund uh, coal in Southeast Asia and Africa." Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, strategically and geostrategically, there has been a, a terrific blunder. I think um, okay. we we're going to have a great night. I can already tell but, because we're already rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, but let me let me also say that I've I've published. I've enjoyed since I retired. Not being a not being required to meet um, performance criteria and being able to yes. dabble and publish things for a wider audience, and I've found that Quadrant Magazine's been a good outlet mm-hmm. for that. Mm-hmm. So I've published quite a few things on the, the pitfalls of renewable energy, uh, and as well, um, most recently on you know the stupidity of of uh, uh, net zero and the looming disaster. Mm-hmm. I think in, in electricity policy in Australia. Mm, mm. Um, but uh, I've also dabbled into um, uh, into the COVID pandemic and right. the and the stupidity of following the the modeling advice uh, of uh, um, uh, Professor Ferguson at, mm. at, oh, at, Ferguson, at yes. the, in the United Kingdom mm. uh, who was disc- the discredited modeler behind uh, Foot and mouth disease twenty years ago, and then mm. uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease, and then one mm. of the flus as well. 
they were all wrong in each case, but somehow he was followed and believed when it came to when it came to uh, to COVID. Uh, you know, and um, you know, uh, it's just amazing that uh, mm. the, the expertise is listened to when it should be discredited. Uh, and um, you know, I I'm a I've got this nice quote that I um, have used. I don't know whether I used it in the book you uh, referred to, but uh, about the pitfalls of modelling, because there's so much of, uh, of uh, particularly environmental science that relies on modelling, and mm. that's the that's the the reason why the virtual environmental science is in the title. Mm. Um, mm. That and the fact that electronic communications like emails have broken down the normal quality assurance mechanisms of anonymous peer review mm. because scientists in any one field now will know each other. They go to mm. the same conferences. The jumbo jet, that neglected element of, of uh, globalization, means they can all fly to conferences quite cheaply mm. and they can all exchange messages uh, by email, as we saw mm. with Climate Gate, of course, where they're all Correct. colluding to, you know, to keep inconvenient papers out of the peer-reviewed literature mm -hmm. um so you know the, the the virtual aspect of it is important but someone once said that um, you know the problem uh, with modeling or or simulation is that if you do it too often uh, it's like masturbation if you do it too often you begin to mistake it for the real thing you know so i, it's, I believe uh, that quote is <laughs> in the book yes okay yeah <laughs> now it's a good we're we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. I, I don't okay. want to. I don't want to skip over the basic building block here. Uh, well, I'm happy, and, and happy, to be, happy to be led wherever you want me to go. No, no I, look, I, I'd like to start if if we could um, take you know distill the years of your life that you put into this amazing book down into a couple of minutes, if you could. What sure. is virtuous corruption for those that have never heard the term, and <clears throat> why did you choose to discuss it, particularly in the context of virtual environmental science? Well, it's probably, you know, it's, it's one of those serendipitous uh, events. We developed uh, in the university, we had an opportunity, we developed a good relationship with Tasmania Police to take over the education and to have an input in the education of uh, recruits. Uh, mm -hmm. That's now been expanded, I think, last time I heard it's it's been uh, extended. We're now also accrediting police training in Victoria, and hopefully we might oh, wow. we might make them a a, a little bit uh, better behaved. And Lord knows better, we need some quality assurance over here. With, with a bit of compass, uh, moral compass, than they seem to have at the moment. <laughs> I can say this because I'm not, I'm retired. So, um, but one of my colleagues uh, in conversation um, talked about the problem in policing and law enforcement. Mm. of uh, what's known as noble cause corruption, mm. whereby, you know, police think they know who's guilty, so they then produce the evidence in order to ensure they get a conviction. Mm. Uh, so it, it's, it's evidence gathered with an end in mind and often, of course, manufactured evidence, mm. um, you know, planting of evidence and so on. Now, when I was trying to... so I. You know, my, my colleague Rob Hall gave me that idea. Um, and then thinking about a subtitle, I mean, the, the publisher always wants a, a more generic title so the science and public policy would maximize their marketing. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, noble cause corruption didn't fit too well with virtual environmental science. So it was a nice alliteration with virtuous mm -hmm. corruption and hence, hence the concept was born. Well, I actually, I find the term virtuous corruption delightful and I've been using it ever since. So my apology if I've been treading on your trademark. Oh, um, but I feel, I, feel free, feel free. No, I, I, I do. And I, and I find this such a compelling concept. And I think the thing, the thing that really clicked for me with this was the realization that in the mind of the police officers, because you do talk about this, this analogy, the, the police, the police prosecutor analogy, they are 100% the good guys. Mm hmm and, and that was the bit that clicked for me. And I, I find this incredibly relevant now because of how many people there are who look at what's happening politically and they jump to the conclusion that it must be some kind of a nefarious, pre-planned conspiracy of some sort. And your book really has given me a, a very different perspective, a different framework. Can, can you talk a little bit more to this idea of virtuous corruption and, and how it is that people 
who mean well, very decent people who might be lovely at a mm. dinner party and in members of our own families can, for all the right reasons, find themselves going down completely the wrong path. Sure. Well, I mean, many of them, of course. I mean, if you're talk, talking about global issues like like climate change, mm. they're wanting to save the planet. You know, mm. I mean, it's a it's the ultimate kind of crusade. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there wasn't much questioning of, of crusades when they were being undertaken. They even press ganged, mm -hmm. you know, children into the children's crusade. I mean, the mm -hmm. the end, it's the old cliche, the end justifies the means. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so um, uh, it's, it, it, and it's a contrast to the normal uh, assumption that, um, science that is endorsed by or used by and often sponsored by industry mm. is is corrupt in sort of uh, in venal in venal ways mm. um, you know that but that assumption is so wrong because uh, I mean since I did this I've spent 15 years of my life working on the OECD and I had some experience of the OECD prior to that I'd written a book on uh, international toxic risk management, including mm. some work on the OECD. And I, knew, I know that, you know, science to be used in a regulatory environment can still be wrong, but it has mm. to be conducted by accredited laboratories. Mm -hmm. uh, and those laboratories are subject to audit. You know, I mean, the, in, in the United States particularly, if the Food and Drug Administration is going to accept uh, evidence produced that a, that a drug or a substance is or a chemical is uh, efficacious, firstly, and safe, then they have to look at evidence which has come from a certified laboratory. And that certified laboratory is subject to audit. In other words, they can pay them a visit and see whether, in fact, the, uh, the number of rats specified in the research were, were there and so on, and that, and that re the research was, was bona fide. And, you know, that's an important difference. And then in the OECD, there's, there's something called a rule of a decision on the mutual acceptance of data, which helps kind of uh, homogenize trade in, in chemicals. So if, if the data is accepted as proper peer-reviewed science in the United States, it will be accepted for regulatory approval in Australia and so forth. So, the, in fact, there's quite a number of checks on the faking of research. But the popular discourse has always been, you know, that, oh, well, you know, business is corrupt. You know, the sort of, um, oh, I'm just trying to think of what was what was the, uh, the, the great movie with Julia Roberts with the community being poisoned with hexavalent chromium. Uh, was uh, that the the Pelican Brief, or was that? No, no, no. That was uh, I forget the name of it. Some of you viewers might oh, remember. Not the one that's uh, named after the. It's named after the woman. Uh, after the, yeah, the lawyer. Yes, 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 yes. I know yeah. the one you mean. Um, yeah. Goodness, and one of my viewers will know. One of my viewers they will. will they will. This is this is useful crowdsourcing. This is why there is wisdom in in crowds. You see, <laughs> <laughs> when when old old guys like you and I lose. Perhaps Aaron Brockovich. Much. Aaron, Aaron Brockovich. Brockovich thank you it. very much yeah. to the many people I mean, that are all pouring in now. Which was a which was a case about actually the the tactic of suing and then settled, and then settling. Yeah. You know they they sued, but the um, uh, hexavalent chromium um, is known as a known carcinogen, but it doesn't actually mm -hmm. cause the type of cancers that were that were prevalent in the in the local community, but simply mm -hmm. by throwing a lawsuit at uh, uh, at the uh, the company and getting them to settle, they then you know made some money for the community. Um, but you know there's there's a lot of of frankly junk science about, and and when you get into a litigious environment, you see a lot of that as well. Um, mm. And so you need you know quality control, quality assurance in science becomes very very important, and you need to have uh, an open contestation of ideas and of uh, people putting forward uh, research and people having a shot at it and trying to find something wrong with it, mm. um, which has kind of slipped away. I mean, the, the famous Australian example was a, a, an independent scientist called John McLean asked for the raw data from the uh, Hadley Research Unit to have a look at how they'd compiled their 
their um, climate temperature, the head crude uh, data set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it turned out the raw data doesn't exist any longer because they claim they didn't have enough computing power to store it all. Uh, but the response was, uh, why should we give, you, give this to you when all you want to do is find something wrong with it? Now, of course, finding something wrong with, with science is inherent to the scientific process. Yeah, that and is that, science. That is science, yeah. There's, I think Matt Ridley, the British journalist, mm. points mm. out that, you know, there's, there is science as uh, authority and there is science as a process or science and, as and institution and science as a process. And speaking, of Matt, is a, is, is process. speaking of Matt Ridley, if I can just interrupt for a second, um, we're in discussions. He's, he's asked not to come on uh, before December, but he should be on a slow chat either very late this year or very early next year, which I'm looking oh, forward excellent. to as well. Excellent. So, I don't uh, know yeah, him, but I, I just know his work. His work is outstanding. Um, so you, yeah. you're absolutely right. Science is a process. I, 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 without spoiling the book, and I'm not because there's so much in here, I'd love to extract one particular topic that was probably the one that landed the hardest with me. And that was the issue of species extinction. And and to be fair to, to everyone watching, um, Ainsley wrote this book 15 years ago. So this is not going to be right there on the tip of his tongue, fresh in his memory, okay? Um, but the issue of species extinction, and there were two aspects of that that you covered that I can, it's still so clear in my mind. Number one was the number of species being estimated through a formula to be going extinct every year on the basis of habitats being divided up and cut up by human yep. um, activity of some sort. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Because that's probably the one that broke my brain the most. Okay. Well, I mean, these, these claims, are, well, they don't put them out any longer. Um, okay. Although there are still claims that we're in the great, the, the, a great extinction spasm or event as part of the claim of climate emergency, which is not borne out by the evidence. I mean, uh, mm. uh, mm. you know, um, but uh, Greenpeace used to say uh, the number, um, uh, the numbers she, they used to give were between sort of fifty thousand and seventy thousand species going extinct every year, mm. and it was derived from something called the species area model, that um, had the uh, modelled the relationship between an area of land, uh, an area of an island originally and the number of species found on that island. Mm. And then, of course, it was taken from an island setting to non-island, continental-scale landscapes. Mm. And, uh, and, of course, that's a highly questionable <laughs> jump. And, you know, it assumes, for example, that, uh, that species aren't um, also found in other bits of landscape that haven't been cleared or modified by man or whatever. And, uh, you know, I started reading initially probably almost a decade before I uh, published the book at least about, I mean, books like Elson Chase's Playing God in Yellowstone and In a Dark Wood. And, and In a Dark Wood is on the Northwest uh, logging controversy with um, – the supposed impact of the uh, clear felling of native forests on the um, spotted owl. Mm. Now, it, it turned out ultimately that the spotted owl actually preferred uh, regrowth forest because it was more open and it was easier to hunt game, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> but there, was, there, was, there was research produced produced in order to try and bring about <clears> – <throat> a cessation of old growth forestry. Mm, mm. And it turned out it was funded by something called the Cerdna Foundation. Now, the Cerdna, Cerdna is the reverse name of Andrus. And the Andrus family were the largest holders of private forestry uh, resources on the west coast of America. So it was targeted. So, <laughs> so it was targeted, you know, and, and the environmental activists were just basically you know, useful idiots uh, that I, allowed I, I, the Andrus family to, to advance this. Yeah, I, I want to slow down for a split second here. And because um, there's some people, I've, I've got a lot of new people that have only started following me relatively recently and people for whom this would be quite a new concept. So I just want to slow down for a second. What this, you said it was the area species? Species area. 
Yeah. Formula. Yeah. Formula. The species area formula. What it said was, the larger the unbroken area of habitat, the greater the variety of species. Now, there's there's truth to that. And, and you know, if you, when you go to islands, you you will find that the bigger the island, the greater yeah. the biodiversity that's on that island. There, this is not an incorrect starting point. But what broke me, what absolutely blew my mind, Ainsley, is is in the and you go into great detail in your book. They then transferred it to to continents, but they said, well, there's a freeway running down there, which is obviously just going to be the boundary of that habitat. And then there's a fire break through here, and then there's something else over this side. So now instead of having this you know, completely unbroken continent-sized natural habitat area that we presume existed before white man came along, um, we're now going to say that actually with this habitat has been broken down to this size. And if we apply that formula to it, that means X many tens or over time hundreds of thousands of species have simply disappeared. The point that I want to make here, Ainsley, and this I had no idea until it was covered in your book. The claims about missing spe or, or extinct species is not based on them having a species in hand that they can no longer find in habitat. It's purely a calculation that's done on someone's computer. Yeah, yeah. This yeah, is astonishing. And, and this is what passes know, to science. Yeah, and if you compare it with the observational evidence, uh, the IUCN, who maintains a red list, and of course, as you know, I touch on their red list. <laughs> it's something dubious about that. We might discuss that a little bit, a little bit later. But the IUCN estimates in the past 500 years there have been 800 documented cases of species extinction. Right. So most of the most of the species that the you know the Greenpeace and the modelers are counting and trying to to sort of shock us with are virtual species. Yeah. You know they, they haven't even been documented as existing. Yeah. They're just sort of numbers coming out the end of a model. Now, you know I think we should, right. I think we should be um, uh, be concerned about any species becoming extinct. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm and, with you on that. Uh, and uh, but many of them, over history, particularly in prehistory, have become extinct. No thanks to human agency. But if human agency is involved, then of course we should do what we can to conserve those. And uh, you know, so so we should. This is this is an important issue: species extinction. But it's debased as an mm. argument, as a political mm. argument, by the sort of nonsense. Uh, just as you know, people talk about. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, the enormous biodiversity of, uh, of rainforests and how good they are. And I refer in the book to some research I found that suggested that, in fact, deserts were more bio biodiverse than rainforests. It's just, that the, <laughs> it's just that the species tend to be sort of microscopic, some of them bacteria, uh, yeah. you know, some of, the, some of them insects, uh, I mean, they are not uh, charismatic megafauna. Mm, and it's, yeah. of course, it's the charismatic megafauna that we tend to find featured. Uh, and I'm not saying we shouldn't care about uh, the charismatic megafauna. We should. But let's not fool ourselves. Let's actually yeah. base, uh, base our policy on science rather than, as, as uh, someone said of uh, uh, some of this stuff in the United States, and, Science, so not uh, not po not poetry. Um, yeah, you know. yeah. It's it's funny, isn't it? There's 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 people who seem to want to believe that the world is dying, and it's not a question of evidence for them. It's it, there really is this mm. fundamental worldview. But this is yeah. not a problem that is limited to the likes of Greenpeace and these sort of advocacy organisations. Yeah. This is a problem that's actually existing right at the very core of our universities, as has kind of been shown recently with some stuff that's come out. I'll, I'll let you kind of tell that story because you're obviously across it much better than I am. But this yeah. is a very current and very real problem. Yeah. I mean, um, we've had um, uh, two recent cases relating to, well, one is not so recent, but the other's really come to a, come to a head uh, just this week, uh, cases of fabrication of data relating to uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And one involves uh, a Swedish PhD graduate from James Cook University called Una Lonsted, who uh, was found to have um, faked, uh, conducted scientific fraud in her postdoctoral fellowship back 
uh, in Sweden, claimed to have gathered data that she hadn't, uh, but she had earlier come under scrutiny at James Cook University uh, in claiming to have examined more lionfish than in fact she had. Uh, and uh, you might have heard of Peter Ridd, who I think you interviewed last week. Last week, yes, Peter, indeed. Peter was one of those who drew attention to the fact that some of the images of uh, 20 odd lionfish that she claimed to have uh, examined appeared to be the same image. And this was borne out by a, a kind of a computer image forensics uh, guy. Uh, but James Cook kind of cleared the research. You know, this was, uh, uh, you know, this was, uh, this was sort of brushed aside. Um, but then this week, there were um, concerns raised about the research of a PhD student again at James Cook. Funny that. Uh, funny that. Uh, mm. Called, this is the same university, of course, that, that sacked, disciplined and then sacked Peter Ridd for daring mm -hmm. to raise questions mm -hmm. about the quality assurance processes. Yes, I, I, I believe what he said there. was that, that um, James Cook University had a quality assurance problem within their reef department. Mm. Words yeah. that uh, are holding up very well against the rigours of time. Indeed. And uh, there were some uh, other scientists, other, uh, I think, graduate scientists. Uh, the leader, of, I think, was a guy called Tim Clark, who's now at, um, at uh, Deakin University, who first raised questions about the claims of the number of fish and the number of uh, specimens in the experiment. And um, remarkably, you know, this uh, criticism, because they tried to replicate the research, which replication, of course, is a fundamental part of science. And they found they couldn't replicate uh, uh, Daniel Dixon's results. So they raised questions in the international journals. And um, the establishment came down like a ton of bricks. I mean, the lead scientist, a German, I can't remember his name, who, was, who uh, was actually the lead author of the 2018 um, IPCC report uh, into the state of the perils that the oceans were into, because hers was on ocean acidification, which supposedly confused fish so that they swam towards the signals their predators were giving off. And th this was a great tragedy leaving aside the fact that the oceans are actually a buffered alkaline solution and they're becoming less alkaline, if anything. They're nowhere near acid yet, but acidification sounds better than less less, uh, less basic. Um, yeah. You know, and um, so science has, uh, has uh, now formally withdrawn the journal of the American Academy of Science after an investigation by her her university in the United States has decided that these papers must be withdrawn. She was offered the opportunity to voluntarily withdraw them, but didn't do so. So this is this has just appeared. I mean, I heard about it today. Mm. Um, in fact, overnight from someone in the United States drew it to my attention. Uh, and per, I mean, perfect examples of noble cause corruption. Mm. You know. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> We I mean, I, mean I, I put in a paper I gave on the RID case that it's a, a sort of a, um, I mean, it's not just virtuous in this case. It's also, yeah. there's some venal motivations. Yeah, there's some don't butt think, covering going on. Don't forget that, don't forget that uh, Malcolm Turnbull gave $440 million of our hard-earned to the Great Barrier Reef Foundation and El Anthony Albanese has has promised $700 million to save the reef, which the Australian Institute of Marine Science have told us this week has, has got record levels of coral uh, cover. No, you know? no, sorry. Professor, you're, you, do you, what you're failing to understand there is that that must be because of the $440 million oh, that course. was given. And, and, the, and, the seven, and the 700, you know. The, that was promised. That's right. Yeah, it's the, just the reef, yeah, just the reef the that and it. went boing yeah. and a back yeah. it came. Yeah, and I, I'm sure there were, there were no bushfires this year either. So you know. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's, it's all because we voted Labor. Um, look, we seem to me, and, and feel free to disagree, 
at this point, and I know you will. Uh, if you do, you, you you will. You're not you're not a shy. You're not shy about coming forward. But it's it appears to me that we are in a moment in history where science itself, science as a concept, has been thrown into question, into crisis. And this is a really frightening thing to me, because we thought we thought that the minute someone had scientists attached to their name, the minute they were a professor, the minute they were from some sort of a research institute, that we could trust them that when they said something that didn't make sense to us, then we could put aside what we thought, what seemed obvious, what seemed logical to us and go, no, 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 that person knows. They've done research. They're a scientist. And there are so many areas in life right now where scientists, I mean, you know, Tim Flannery, even the rain that falls won't be enough to fill our dams anymore. I mean, you know, there's a lot of superficial examples you can give like that. And there's a lot of really deep examples you can give. Is science itself to be called into question? How does a non-scientist interact with science now under this new kind of paradigm? Well, let me say, first of all, let me preface my, my remarks by saying there are a, a lot of good scientists out there that I know and who do have integrity uh, and who I would trust. But part of the problem is the politicization of science, which you mentioned earlier, uh, and the fact that, um, you know, I would be and they would be, if they spoke out, they would be labelled as deniers, you know, which, uh, as you know, I trace in, in, the, in my book back to the reaction to Bjorn Lomborg, that uh, reviewers of Lomborg's book uh, back in, uh, in uh, 2000 odd said that, oh, Lomborg, you know, questions, um, questions um, the uh, n numbers of species extinctions. Um, and uh, he says, well, you know, what species have gone extinct? And uh, the response was, well, he's like, you know, the Holocaust denier who wants us to name, you know, people who were, were killed in the Holocaust. And, and uh, what and a low you, blow. What and, a low blow. Well, someone so low, to that. It's a low blow, but it's also, you know, I mean, when I've been uh, one of my many visits of, to Paris, because when I was buying Calvados and, uh, uh, and researching the OECD, uh, which my colleague Peter Carroll and I have written, now written three books on, um, but I went to the, uh, the Deportation Museum uh, where the... Uh, um, those transported from Paris and France by the collaborating Vichy regime were, were deported to concentration camps. Now, you know, this is why I, I, I don't mind uh, deniers like David Irving being allowed to, to, to put their, their case because I think it's bullshit. Uh, but if, if, it's, if it's fabricated, Someone spent an awful lot of time writing out card index files with people's names and dates of birth and relatives and so on on them that are that are there to be seen, not just faking the, the movies and the photographs and so on. It's an empirical claim. It's an empirically falsifiable claim. It's it's nonsense. Uh, but let it let it be seen to be nonsense rather than sort of making some sort of martyr out of people like him. And yeah, I. I but, I'm a free but, speech absolutist, even yeah. for people that are spouting what, in my exactly. belief, is nonsense, such as Holocaust exactly. denial. Yeah. I'm a free and, speech absolutist. And, of course, Lomborg is, is so dangerous because he uses official statistics to make his point. And most recently, you know, the claim that there's a, we're in the midst of a climate emergency, uh, which in itself is nonsense, and I can talk you might talk through the, the, uh, the history of that uh, beginning in... Uh, 2016, if you wish. Uh, but Lomborg has shown, for example, that your risk of dying from an extreme climate-related event in 2020 was 1% of what it was in 1920. Now, there's nothing emergency about that. You know. Uh, and and, that's, and, with an, and it, that's with a vastly larger population. Oh, you would yeah. think of anything, yeah. well, would be more I, likely to be marginal and vulnerable. Yeah. I think from memory he does weight according to, po to population, or okay. maybe he doesn't, yeah. but, but don't, don't hold me on that. Even, even um, so. Yeah. But, you know, the, the climate emergency um, 
began, the claims of climate emergency began in late 2016 when some Greens Party candidates on the Darabin Council in Melbourne decided mm. that they would have the council adopt a motion declaring a climate emergency. I don't know, maybe there was, you know, uh, <clears throat> fights and uh, uh, you know, localised droughts or whatever. Uh, but the... Um, the um, they adopted, and then it spread through a sort of green, the green network, particularly at local government level, spread globally. And it wasn't globally, and it wasn't until late 2018 it appeared in a biology journal with a kind of petition written by, signed by a number of, of, of scientists, that it then took off, and everybody who wanted to claim, you know, some sort of scientific basis for it then said, oh, well, we're in the midst of a climate emergency. And, of course, then you get the, bring, the the fallacy of bringing evidence to the theory. You get some bushfires in Australia, which have occurred since time immemorial, but their impact is greater, partly because, you know, green, green political activists won't let them engage in forest redu hazard reduction burns, mm -hmm. and we allow people, to, allow people to tree change and erect houses in the middle of forests. So when there is an inevitable forest, they get their houses burned. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, floods, you know, you fight the raising of the Warragamba Dam for 20 years uh, and the erection of other flood control mechanisms. So when the floods do come, uh, there's no protection from them. And uh, I, yeah. I do note, you mentioned Tim Flannery. I notice he's been rather quiet for the past uh, few Look. months with his claims that, uh, that the even the rain that falls isn't mm. going to isn't going Listen. to fill, fill the dams. Um, but, you know, he's, people following that kind of logic um, resulted in the construction of around 10 to $12 billion worth of desalination plants that have been useless, effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good example of the cost of that erroneous thinking. I've got the Australian Associated Press up my uh, my backside at the moment. They're they're going through absolutely everything I say with a forensic fine tooth comb. <laughs> if Tim Flannery ever has the balls, the gall to pop his head back up, I'll be writing to the AAP and uh, asking them whether they're going to allow this misinformation peddler to uh, to spread his lies and misinformation uh, online. I look forward to seeing what they say. I've actually got the inside running on the Darabin Council because I grew up in Preston, which is inside yeah. Darabin's purview i actually remember it before it was amalgamated and became darabin and they are such an appalling council not only not only failing to do the basics of being a, like a council's job is to make sure that you can walk down the footpath without breaking your ankle and to yeah. make sure the bins are collected like that is a local council's job um yeah. you know make sure there isn't obscene amounts of rubbish lying on the ground at the local parks and that's what a local council does but they've got these delusions of grandeur and so not only were the, the footpaths largely unpassable um, and the bin collection unreliable, but they were spending all of this time on, on doing this sort of Aboriginal um, murals on various public sort of uh, places. I've got no objection to that, but it shouldn't be paid for with public money. I don't think any, I don't think there should be such a thing as public art funded with public money. That's just my opinion. Um, but I actually got to the point where there was an election, there was a local council election, and I looked at all of the candidates, every single person that was up for election, and I realized that in good conscience, I could not vote for a single one of them. There was not, it, you know, it, sometimes there's a candidate, you're like, they've got no chance of winning, but at least they're a decent candidate, and I'll, I'll give them my vote anyway, even though I know they're not going to win. There wasn't even that. There was a choice between, between socialists and Marxists. That was your choice. Yeah. And so I refused to vote. I refused to show up and vote. And I got a fine shortly afterwards for not voting. And I wrote a very terse letter in which I quoted the Constitution, which uh, talks about the fact that each uh, citizen is free to use their vote as they see fit. And I went through the Black's Law Dictionary with the definition of all of the words as they see and fit uh, in order to actually define that sentence that must include withholding that vote if that is what you see fit. Yeah. And I further went on to, to I have managed to dig up, I can't remember, I'm going to have to go back in my archives and find this letter. Uh, I, I, I dug up in the, uh, in, uh, from a, a high court precedent that ruled against being able to require someone to engage in a farce. And a farce was defined as engaging in the form of a thing with, whilst having no influence over the outcome of the thing. 
And this was my immediate, my preemptive defense against them saying, oh, but you should have gone and gotten your, your, your name ticked off from the role. Well, that would be a farce, Your Honor. Yeah. That would be requiring me to pretend to participate in something without having any influence on the outcome. So I sent this letter and I weirdly never heard back from them. They never chased that money from me. I'm not quite sure why that would be, but they, um, they didn't seem so keen on getting that $55 off me after I gave them a hard time. Well, of course, compulsory voting means only it's compulsory to, to turn up. I mean, Correct. You, you can't be compelled to cast a valid vote. So, you know, the, the trick of all is always, if you wish to do that, is to simply spoil your ballot paper, write on it, none of the above or you know, none of these turkeys and stick it in the in the ballot box. And, yeah, I couldn't even know, be bothered no, doing no. that. <laughs> Couldn't even be bothered doing that, but yeah, they they um they didn't chase me for the money after I sent them that particular letter. I, I it's, uh, it was one of my one of my little early wins in my early days yeah. of moving from being a conservative to being a a, a libertarian. <laughs> so well, we have similar problems in Hobart. I mean, the uh, I think the vote the full council might be voting tonight on uh, uh, the recommendation of a committee to remove. Uh, the uh, statue of a former premier of Tasmania. Crowther, who uh, behaved badly because he uh, he stole the uh, the head of of the deceased last um, uh, totally hundred percent Aboriginal Tasmanian William Lenny, mm. uh, and sent it off to uh, to London for for study, and uh, he was also Premier of Tasmania, and. Um, uh, so it's now been decided that he must be cancelled, and uh, the um, uh, I'm sure the council will do this. Um, they, they have, for example, already wasted seven thousand. It's going to cost seventy to one hundred thousand dollars to take it down and replace it with some other piece of execrable art. And uh, but uh, you know. The point is, and I and I tried to make a post on the on the Mercury website, but didn't make it past moderation. Um, that while by today's standards we'd find this objectionable conduct on on Crowther's part, um, in the day, in the context of the day, it was normal scientific inquiry. Yeah. And if you read, if you read scholarly journals circa 1900, as I did, I mean, I I started off as a medical student. Um, I had this sort of eclectic education where I did, you know, first year university science, got into medical school, even got a got a um, summer research scholarship from the New Zealand Medical Research Council, which I gave up when I dropped out of medical school because I found there was too much rote learning. I couldn't stand it. Um, mm. So, you know, I was doing a project on the postnatal histological changes of the ductus arteriosus and rabbits. <laughs> And so I was, wow. I, was a about to, I was about to become the lead, the, the world's leading expert, and I persisted. Um, but um, you know, so I had to had to go back and look in. There was no you know, electronic searches in those days. I had to go back into the uh, the journals, and there on the American uh, Journal of, of uh, Anatomy with, with stuff on you know measuring the cranial capacity cranial capacity of of uh, Negroes versus Caucasians. Yeah. But the, the, but the point is that it's because we went through all that that we know that there is no anatomical or physiological basis to racist beliefs. And we, we might not have known that. And that's how we know that that's the case. Mm. So, yes, we can regret the way in which that was discovered. But, you know, at the end of the day, that was taken within its context uh, of the time it was horrible yeah. behavior by today's standards, but yeah. you know, you you can't you can't sort of deracinate events in that way. I will say the Hobart City Council also wasted seven thousand dollars of our ratepayers' money trying to establish a speaker's corner in Franklin Square, which nobody came to. So perhaps if they left it now, we might turn up and talk about the crowd, the statue removal, you know. Yes, yeah, that's right. Um, so, so coming coming from the past very much into the modern day, you mentioned earlier that you're doing some writing for Quadrant and, and others and doing some work around uh, the folly of this net zero target. This is something that I haven't explored in any depth in any of my slow chats up to this point in time. And I, I think it's 
it's a very relevant, very real issue that is not going away anytime soon. Why do you view it as something of a folly? Oh, I think we're headed for uh, for disaster. I mean, there is uh, uh, someone who's put together a case that um, we're already at, um, at net zero. If you actually look at our actual calculations in, in terms of you know what our landscape fixes by way of CO2 and so on, uh, other than using the IPCC's methodology, uh, and um, and so on. I haven't, as I say, I haven't got my head around this, whether it's whether it holds up or not. Mm. Then we're already there. But you know, let's assume that that's not the case. We are uh, about only a thirty odd percent of our emissions of CO two come from uh, energy and from electricity generation. And so there's a lot of, of you know, we focus on electricity, the electricity system, but there's a lot in agriculture and all sorts of things um, and so on. Well, this um, is what we're seeing. Sorry. This is what we're seeing, though, we're playing out in Holland uh, and being threatened in Canada, et cetera, where they're trying to cut down yeah. on fertilizer usage, et cetera. I mean, net zero yeah. really does reach far more broadly than just energy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of your commenters just made a remark about phrenology and phrenology, uh, yes, <laughs> and uh, which I saw. And uh, I, I'd like to point out that uh, sitting on the mantelpiece is uh, a phrenology head. Oh wow! And, and a palmistry uh, hand, uh, which I've collected over the years, and I like yes. to, I like to use them to remind me that uh, what was once accepted uh, scientific belief changes and is debunked with time. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I do have a, a sort of 17th century map of the world as well by a Dutch cartographer that reminds me how accurately they could get things without yep. modern technology as well. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> just, to, just to remind me that, that no, there is good science as well as, as, well as uh, nonsense. Yeah. Um, but, but just just on that, sorry, I, I was chatting. I think it was I think it was in my chat last week with Professor Peter Reed, talking about this kind of circle of knowledge. And I have a theory, and it will only ever be a theory because it's, it, it is neither provable nor falsifiable. Right. Uh, but I have a theory that at any given moment in time, at least half of what we believe we know is wrong. Yeah. And 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 that has always been true, and that actually will always be true because the boundaries of our knowledge will always be advancing, and yeah. by the very nature of new knowledge, the very edge of knowledge, we are far yeah. more likely to be wrong than right. Now yeah. there are things that are, that sit in sort of the center of that circle of knowledge, things that have been tested over and over again, things yeah. that can be empirically tested. You know, and, uh, principles of engineering. If yeah. we didn't yeah. understand those, we would have bridges and buildings falling over all over the place. Yeah. We can be pretty Airplane, sure. Airplanes would fall from the sky, you know. Correct. Yeah. We can be pretty sure that the principles of engineering are pretty well rock solid. Is there more to discover? Maybe. But what we're using right now works, and we can be pretty confident in it. Uh, when, you, when you get to things that are much more um, prone to, I, I think, the misapplication of science, things like medical science, it gets a bit more sketchy. When you get to the real edge of sort of theoretical physics, etc., I think it becomes very sketchy. And at any moment in time, it is my personal view, no one will ever convince me otherwise, but at the same time, I'll never be able to prove it. It is my personal view that more than half of what we think we know is actually wrong. And regardless of whether you agree with that premise, I think there's a certain amount of humility that we need to approach our science with. The recognition that we've been wrong so many times before. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, let me just talk on this, and we, we, we must get back to talking about the folly of, of net zero, yes, uh, yes. which we st strayed a little bit from. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, I tend to follow uh, Karl Popper's philosophy of science that says mm -hmm. that we we have imperfect knowledge. Uh, his approach is called, we often referred to as critical realism, but that uh, we regard things as real, but we we take skepticism to it, and we regard everything as uh, provisionally true. But mm -hmm. we regard things as more reliable knowledge once they have 
still been subjected to multiple attempts at falsification. And if it's withstood multiple attempts at falsification, then it's more reliable than if it hasn't been subjected to, to decent, rigorous, independent scientific analysis. Uh, and, you know, that's that's what becomes important. I mean, John, there's a guy called John Ioannidis, who's a, uh, uh, a medical scientist at Stanford. I quoted fact, his work extensively in March 2020. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Who said not just ordinary people, but, but half of, sci of medical science journal articles turn out to be false. Half. Uh, well, this and, comes back uh, to the replication problem that you mentioned earlier on yeah. in the interview. There is yeah. a huge replication problem. No. And, you know, there's a tendency, I mean, I, I noticed a particular tendency in environmental science, and particularly the highly charged um, area of climate science, that if there's something, some inconvenient finding is produced out there, you just ignore it. You know, I, I know some good skeptical uh, evidence that is not highly cited. I mean, a good example is um, a, a former colleague and someone I still see occasionally, Garth Paltridge, Professor Garth, Garth Paltridge was once head of CSIRO's atmospheric research. And he's skeptical of the mainstream, you know, we're all going to hell in a handcart kind of version of climate science. He's not a denier. He knows that, uh, you know, elevated levels of CO2 in the atmosphere will force the, uh, the atmosphere a little bit. Uh, pretty much the same as Slanty Arrhenius found in 1896 with 1 1.2 degrees Celsius, which has actually been as accurate as millions of, if not billions of dollars spent on on computer modeling. Um, and Garth and some people decided that they would examine this proposition that a little bit of global warming will produce more water vapor in the atmosphere. Uh, take note, Tim Flannery, because a warmer atmosphere is going to be a more humid one. There's going to be more water. And as I, I was a reviewer, expert reviewer for the IPCC, 2006, and I remarked then it seemed as though this wetter world was going to have seen no, no rain was going to fall in anywhere that was at all useful. You know, it was either going to be floods or wouldn't wouldn't fall gently on areas where the arability of, of land would be extended and so on. You know, it was all going to presumably flood people who didn't want to be flooded without filling or again the dam, as according to Flannery. It was very, very, um, sort of very carefully targeted rainfall. Yeah. So, they, so they looked at the, they looked at all the weather balloon data historically, going back, you know, many years, and they found that there was no evidence that as temperature, global temperatures had warmed slightly, that water vapor increased accordingly. Mm -hmm. In fact, they concluded that if anything, the increased water vapor might form clouds that might. Uh, act as negative feedback mm. rather than positive feedback. Mm -hmm. Now, so he submitted it to a journal, and the journal turned out to be edited by the guy who was the leader of the Green Party in British Columbia, <laughs> which again is another, another wonderful example of the corruption, the noble course corruption of science. Uh, and, a, and he accepted a referee's report that said, uh, why should we publish this when all they're trying to do is get something in the peer-reviewed literature that undermines the basis for action on climate change? You know, <laughs> head palm stuff, face palm stuff. They submitted it to another journal and got published, but it hasn't been widely cited, of course, because yeah. it's not, conven not convenient. Um, so, you know, this is the problem. But, you know, when you, when you turn to, you know, scholarship and you come back to come back to, you know, I'm chairing the discussion now. <laughs> when you come back back to uh, uh, net zero, um, which the previous government was absolutely foolish to, to embrace, mm -hmm. um, but when you come back um, to uh, to look at that issue, um, the experience in Germany has been well studied. You know, they have this sort of policy called energy vendor, which they're now regretting because. It relied on a a lot of imported uh, gas from Vladimir, 
who hasn't been as a reliable a supplier as they might have expected. Uh, really? Despite... That's such a surprise. I, I, yeah, what's happening? I, I haven't heard whatever's happening. What are you referring yeah, yeah, to? Yeah. Well, one it hasn't of the been scand- in the news. One of the really scandalous aspects of all this was that Gerhard Schroeder, the Social Democrat, former Chancellor, four days before he left office, having been defeated, approved a €4 billion Euro, uh, loan to Gazprom. And he's now the chair of Gazprom. Uh, you know, he was appointed by Putin as the, I think, initially the chair of the Community Consultation Council or whatever. He doesn't show his face in Germany these days. Um, but anyway, th- what they found, and there's some very good uh, economics economists who've researched this, that um, as you increased the, the proportion of renewables on the grid, on a mixed grid, when you get to about where we are now, 25, 30%, the value of renewables declines markedly because with the merit order dispatch model we've got in the national market that um, gives preference to renewables when the sun's shining or the wind's blowing, they must be accommodated, which destroys the economics of dispatchable, mostly coal-fired generation so that everyone who owns those things, well, what's the point in owning these any longer? And what's the point? We'll, we'll take them off offline in however many years, and it's not worth spending money on, uh, on uh, maintenance in the meantime, yeah. so you're getting yeah. more breakdowns. Um, yeah. so, so we're headed for disaster, and you've got people like Chris Bowen talking about, oh, you know, we can have, we can have um, pumped storage hydro, which is about 85% efficient, so you, mm. it actually consumes about 15% of generation in order to shift it to a more convenient time. Mm. Or batteries, and batteries are, I mean, the environmentalist Michael Schellenberger estimated that you'd need 700 batteries costing $500 billion to stabilise, to provide the energy for the Australian eastern grid, Western Australia's fortunate they're out of this, for four hours. And I'm sorry, that's just Australia. We are, in terms of population, we are a tiny freaking country. Yeah. Multiply that by what's needed in China, India, yeah. so many other parts of Asia, Africa. I, it's it's not. I mean, there are so many trillions of dollars. These well, your... these people that are saying this is possible, they yeah. are either incredibly stupid or they think we're incredibly stupid. It's got to be one or the other. Well, the Chinese aren't stupid. They're building, you know, they're good, building a lot of coal-fired power plants. Coal-fired power stations, and one yeah. of them, one of the most recent ones was was commissioned was built for them by GE, the American company, um, and uh, it's a what they call not just ultra supercritical technology, but advanced ultra supercritical technology, mm. Mm. and it achieves forty nine point one percent conversion efficiency, which is getting up to the area of gas. It's uh, it's very gas. good. Yeah, and now the global fleet average is about thirty-four percent. So here's a fifteen percent leap improvement available from the average. Now, for every one percent improvement in efficiency, you get a two to three percent reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Is that right? But the great scandal know. is the great scandal is that we've we've got a kind of prohibition approach to this. You know, we. We, we can't have any coal. No lump of coal must ever be burned ever again because it's the most carbon intensive rather than saying, okay, well, let's look at a mix. Let's have a reliable system that maybe uses a bit of a bit of solar when the sun's shining, maybe uses a bit of wind when the wind's blowing and sometimes it doesn't blow. And as they found in Europe uh, last uh, autumn, mm. there were um, prolonged periods of practically zero wind. and Excuse me. The UK was importing nuclear energy from France and, and lots of gas before before uh, they were dotted by Vladimir. Um, so you know, rather than having a sensible kind of um, balanced system uh, that over time we over you know, time we churn through from our existing generation stock to to advanced ultra supercritical and reduce our emissions from coal 
whilst also putting in some gas while also having yeah. some hydro if, if the Greens will let us build dams, um, as as well as solar and and uh, wind. But, you know, we, we just ignore all the downside of renewables, including yeah. what do we do at the end of life? You know, it's not just, you know, solar panels can contain cobalt and lead and God knows what. And at the moment, they're going... To landfill, they're starting to retire the first ones in California. They've got, they're not being recycled because they cost more to recycle than they cost to buy. Uh, and they're now finding, and there's research coming out on leading edge erosion from in wind turbines. Um, and there's one company, I think, offshore in Denmark that's had to reduce, uh, had to replace their their blades after 12 years. Mm. And some Norwegians have pointed out that. The erosion from dust, grit, uh, bats, birds, and so on, wearing away at the, the leading edge, uh, also um, ensures that oh, this wonderful substance that they contain called bisphenol A, which for years ago, a few years ago, we were desperate to keep out of babies' bottles and so on, is being washed into, into the sea. So offshore, wind turbines are even worse than onshore ones uh, it's, but there's, there's, a, there's a glimmer of hope the Greens in Tasmania have now come out and opposed the Robbins Island wind farm right. which I pointed out a few couple of years ago it, again in a Quadrant article uh, is likely to, to uh, churn up numerous uh, wedge-tailed eagles and other birds but they've caught yeah. on to the fact that it's on, it's on the flight path, migratory flight path for the swift parrot and the orange belly parrot so you know, we might we might get some balance. We might finally get some um, whole nice. li life cycle consideration with these technologies, well, rather than just you know focusing on one aspect. He, here's the thing: from, from my perspective, there are greens and and environmental organisations around the world that do appear to be data driven. There are some that do appear to be saying, hey, we're concerned about the degradation of the environment, the impact that humans are having, etc." And then they go to the data and they allow science to tell them what the solution would be. There are groups in Europe, for example, that are championing nuclear energy. It is my personal opinion that that is a good step forward from where we are. Uh, Ainsley, you're, you're welcome to disagree with me, but that's, that's where I stand on that. Um, but they're also in, and especially in the Western English speaking world, there seems to be a problem that is particularly acute here, where environmentalism has become a euphemism for anti-humanism, yeah. where, where there's almost like a proxy has been, has been substituted in. It's hard to measure environmental improvement, but you can definitely measure um, negative impacts to the economy. So if we just do things that are bad for the economy, then surely that must be good for the environment. Is that fair? Am I, am I misreading that? Yeah, well, there's there's also um, a strand of um, of apocalypticism in all this, and again, I published in in Quadrant. If you if your viewers want to you know, go, search for it on the Quadrant mm. online website, um, uh, an essay called "The Lure of the Apocalypse," mm. and how how apocalyptic thought is is quite um, attractive uh, these days. Um, and I see Benjamin Robin, Robson saying it's energy Marxism. Yes, Marxism is part of that. Mm. Marxist thought is is millenarian. It's um, it's the uh, it's the sort of thought that arises from Christian Christian kind of thinking, mm. Christian points of view that um, in rapid social change, society is falling apart. There will be an apocalypse. But out the other side, there will be a thousand year, hence millenarian, mm. uh, period where the virtuous will be saved uh, and yeah. we will hold, hold hands. And, and a thousand years is meant to imply uh, as long as you can possibly imagine. Mm. Uh, and we find it in Marxism, you know, after the um, revolution uh, and the dictatorship of the proletariat, which we, the, the state will wither away. And we'll then have communism in which there'll be no state. We'll all be wonderful self-governing uh, uh, individuals. We find it in, uh, well, it's there in the, in the Bible. If you read the book of uh, Revelation, mm. you know, it's, it's, it's definitely apocalyptic. But it's also there in Marxism. Um, yeah. You know, um, sorry, there in, I said Marxism. Stop at the top. It's there in National Socialism. 
you know, Hitler was sure. was talking about a thousand year Reich for a reason. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was it was straight out millenarianism, uh, and uh, you know, so we've seen it. And there are there have been one or two studies of environmentalism as uh, a millenarian movement. Mm. And I, I must say that um, I have to put my hand up and confess, as a younger person, I was part of that. Mm. Uh, okay. I was. I was, uh, as, a, as a student at the University of Otago, I became enthusiastic about the Club of Rome as prognostications. Yes, okay. Yep. And uh, what was really the first national environmental policy uh, political party in the world called mm. the New Zealand Values Party, the founder of which Tony Brunt sent when I was working on the student newspaper, uh, his kind of manifesto, one person started a party, and I thought, oh, this is wonderful stuff. Mm. It was also very sort of liberal, politically liberal in terms of, you know, drugs, abortion, free speech, yeah. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite, quite appealing. Um, and I then wrote my um, honours thesis on their ideology. Um, mm, okay. Um, but I sort of became, you know, more, more and more sceptical with time. Mm. I began to it's see the nonsense. On. In, in, mm. As time went on, and so by the time I got to uh, Tasmania, I was here for four years in the early '80s. I, I came back in '99, having been uh, around Australia a bit. Um, but I was then basically rejecting, you know, green thought. I mean, I I helped the, the anti dams campaign. I, I helped. Uh, I recorded a, a little advertisement for the referendum campaign. Okay. Uh, ironic, ironically saying that we didn't need to build a dam on the Gordon below Franklin because there was coal in Tasmania. The Greens were in favour of <laughs> favour of coal if it would save the Franklin, you know. Uh, yeah. but, but, but then I became a member of the Labor Party and I was a member of the ALP Minerals and Ener State Minerals and Energy Policy Committee. Right. Uh, and then I, ultimately I decided I don't really fit anywhere and I'm a much better unencumbered by not belonging to political movements or organisations, I've I've been a member and active in professional organisations, but not not uh, political ones. So, I speak to and you know are happy to talk to mm. political organisations. Anyone who is prepared to listen, but I don't. I made a point, make a point of not actually formally joining them and signing mm. up to. Mm. You know. Look, for a long time, I, I actually took the same approach and uh, only relatively recently signed up to the Liberal Democrats and then actually ran, uh, as you know, in Tasmania as the uh, the Senate candidate, very much unsuccessfully, it has to be said. Uh, but a very curious thing happened while I was in Tasmania campaigning, and that was that Bob Brown came out in it was Australian Story or Landline or one of those ABC shows and was talking about the fact that there was no need to ramp up Tasmanian mining of minerals for batteries, cobalt, lithium, et cetera. There was no need to do that because what we should actually do is import all of those from Africa, from African countries. And he <laughs> names he named two countries specifically. I don't remember the other one, but one of the countries that he names is Congo. Yep. Now, if you know anything at all about mining in the Congo, you know that it involves child labor, yep. slave labor, utterly inhumane working conditions, horrific mm -hmm. health implications as these people are working with toxic minerals without any yep. protection whatsoever. And here we have the poster child of the Greens movement in Australia, someone who was instrumental in the United Tasmania front prior to the Greens and then in the foundation of the Greens itself really was there from the very beginning of one of the very earliest Greens movements, uh, successful, politically successful Greens movements in Australia, sitting there with a straight face on national television mm -hmm. and saying, no, we should build my rich white man's dream on the back of black child slave labour. I'm sorry to put it so crassly, but yeah. how did we end up here? Yeah. Well, I mean, the... We can add to that the Chinese dominate the, uh, the PV solar panel market, and uh, yes. it's very well documented that they're employing Uyghur slave labour there for that production process. And of course, again, in terms of life cycle analysis, um, not only do people not um, look at 
um, end of life disposal of these things containing toxic toxic chemicals. They don't look at the manufacturing process. And there was a, a nice analysis that a German uh, scientist did some years ago, where he uh, pointed out that they, in manufacturing solar panels, they use solvents like nitrogen trifluoride and sulfur hexafluoride yep. uh, to, to sort of clean the uh, electronics and so on. Now, these happen to be greenhouse gases, mm -hmm. and they have uh, global warming potential numbers of the order of 20,000 times more than carbon dioxide. And he did his numbers and calculated that under German solar conditions, it would be better for the climate to burn gas, certainly to burn gas, than to use solar yeah. energy. Mm -hmm. but, no, but no one ever, you know, no one considers this. No one looks at the downside. I mean, it always reminds me of, I think it was about 1928, that, you know, with concern over the use of ammonia refrigerants, mm. the wonderful advance was made where they developed something that would replace it that wouldn't kill people when it leaked. Mm. And this was the beginning of chlorofluorocarbons. Mm -hmm. CFCs, no very much the no one, sense. No one thought that they might, you know, <laughs> cause any problem at all. Mm. Um, but, you know, they, that has... They impacted the environment. They, yeah. I mean, I, I think to some extent uh, we don't really worry about people dying from skin cancer because the ozone layer is thin these days. Uh, I mean, Greenpeace did. Greenpeace did for the Sydney Olympics, wanted to have a green, green Olympics and advocated using ammonia for air conditioning and refrigeration <laughs> systems. <That's, laughs> I didn't at, know at, that. At, at, at Sydney. So, you know. <laughs> And that's, that's, that would have been good as long as there's no leak, you know. I mean. Look, Melissa's got it. I think Mel Melissa's absolutely nailed it here. The sun and wind is renewable. Solar and yeah. wind power are not renewable. This yeah. is the key distinction that some people seem willfully ignorant of. They think that solar panels and wind turbines absolutely pop up out of nowhere. I had uh, the most, one of the most frustrating conversations I've ever had was with someone that I know who's massively on the whole left, green, save the world, you know, CO2 is killing us all. <laughs> and I had this incredibly infuriating conversation where they wanted to tell me that wind power was free and their evidence, their evidence that it's completely free is that if the wind blows for 10 hours or for 11 hours on a given day, it doesn't cost you any more. So that 11th hour, that extra hour is free. Therefore, wind energy is free. And I just, mm -hmm. I, oh, I. Yeah, they're, oh. Yeah, they're marginal, they're marginal, short run marginal cost is essentially zero. But the this is where the, the current government, uh, particularly the relevant minister, Really has no understanding of, of electricity systems because there have been there's been a lot of quotation of you know renewables being the cheapest, uh, but they're looking at um, at levelized cost of energy figures. What the what the appropriate figure is uh, is um, system levelized cost of energy, which is what does it cost to meet demand in the system on a reliable basis. Mm. You know, because there's no point in saying, oh, you know, the wind will blow for 10 hours. What about the other 14 hours? Correct. You know, that, that's the problem. And, um, you know, I've got a, a friend, I'll acknowledge uh, his contribution, Alex Coram, who's a, a much more numerate than I am, mm. uh, who has done some good work on uh, on the economics of this. And he uh, he uses the analogy, and I think it's a very good one to try and get across to people, um, of it being like someone saying, look, I will contract with you to provide you with 365 pizzas over the next year. Yeah. The problem is there might be some weeks when you'll get none. There'll be some days when you get 15. Would you sign up for that deal? That's beautiful. Of course, of, course, of course you wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, as I say, I've got to acknowledge him because, mm. you know, footnote, 
must acknowledge sources. Um, yeah. But it, it's a wonderful way of putting it. Now, you know, it doesn't matter. I mean, you you, you sit here some days in, in Hobart, and we've got a lot of, lot of wind capacity in, in Tasmania. You sit here some days, it's overcast, and there's not a breath of wind or barely mm. any wind. Mm. Fortunately, in, in Tasmania, we're okay because we've got lots of hydro capacity. Sure. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, Bob Brown opposing, well, he's probably opposing, you know, the, the, the mine site that was um, denied its tailings dam recently by the incoming minister. I have a uh, feeling that was exactly it, yes. In, in order to save the the masked owl, you know, um, and uh, how long we are, I think giving a, an invited talk on uh, my uh, the, the book you opened with, um, I came up with <laughs> indeed. I came up with uh, what I what I called Callow's Law of Endangered Species. Ah, uh, yes. Which was, which was that endangered endangered species are found clustered around development sites. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, and, that actually hurts. Let me tell you a story. You have no idea what I'm about to tell you. Well, let, let me uh, uh, let me just first say that okay. there's, a, there's a semi-serious angle to that. Sure. Because often, often until a development is proposed, no one does an environmental assessment. And often the environmental assessment finds endangered species. So there is a there can be a genuine reason for it. Uh, but and endangered species don't just hang about in wilderness, of course. They hang about in degraded kind of, you know, rubbishy urban landscapes and so on as well. But then, of course, it's always always wonderful to find a an endangered species that you can bring before the environmental courts and say, oh, look, this species is endangered. And, of course, again, there's a, I've got an article in, uh, in Quadrant on the Adani mine mm. where they're actually using... They were using the wrong endangered species to to try and stop the Adani mine, but there have been other examples where they've you know they've they've spotted a uh, um, um, an orange-bellied parrot somewhere near a wind site, you know, and tried to and tried to stop uh, the wind farm. But sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 not at all. I was in, you, you you interrupted me whilst I was cutting you off. Um, no, it's it's <laughs> fine. Um, okay, so. My passion is actually business. Being a political commentator was never a dream of mine. And so yes. for the last six years, I've been working on a new business. We've got patents, worldwide patents, on a new, completely new model of go-karting, as in, yes, mm -hmm. driving around in little go-karts. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a method of track design. It's it's completely unique. No one else in the world has ever done it before, and I think it's it's yeah. a really, really amazing idea that has a real electric, potential. Electric, electric, I hope. Well, we are going electric. In the case of the site that we were working on in Melbourne, it was electric simply because of its proximity to other houses. So the noise was the issue. But to be yeah. honest, electric makes sense for go-karts. For recreational yeah. go-karts, you've got a 70 kilometer an hour speed limit anyway. It's not yeah. about top speed. It's about acceleration. And electric can give you very good acceleration. So yes, we were electric. But here's the thing. We had a site. It was a fantastic site for what we wanted to do. It was largely under power lines. Um, it was not going to get used for anything else useful, but we could build our track there and and have a building off to the side just out of the, the power line easement. Uh, and it was going to be absolutely amazing. But when they did their environmental studies, they discovered a dwarf galaxious fish. Mm. Now, this yeah. is a supposedly endangered fish. And so what had to be done was the developer of the land who we were working with to try and get our site, our go-kart site on there as well, the developer of the land had to spend a quarter of a million dollars building a big lake for the purpose of housing the dwarf galaxias fish, taking up multiple acres. So this is his land area that was land previously where mm -hmm. they found, sorry, I should say this, they found the dwarf galaxias fish in a ditch next to the road. <laughs> and I am, I am not joking when I say that that ditch also had a tire and a shopping trolley in it. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm not. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not caricaturing. That's actually absolutely true. And they found the dwarf galaxias fish in there. And so the developer had to spend a quarter of a million dollars, build a massive dwarf galaxias hotel in the form of a lake, and then. And I, I'm. I wish I was making this up. This is, <coughs> this is too absurd to be true. He had to go down 
to an aquarium, a pet fish shop, and buy this supposedly endangered fish <laughs> to then put in. To I mean, I'm sorry. You can buy the endangered <laughs> fish at an aquarium. Something is not right here. Something is wrong. How do we get back to sanity, Ainsley? How do we get back well, to the point where we can trust our scientists again? Well, this is where, I mean, you reminded me of the, of the episode I discussed in my book on the what turned out to be the, the planting of evidence of the Canadian lynx uh, in, uh, I think it was in California, uh, by some national parks uh, um, officials, uh, employees. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they were found out, but often things are not... Uh, <laughs> Are not, of course, endangered, but the, the the very words endangered, of course, have cachet. The only way um, through this, and I, and I, you know, I hope that we will uh, come out with something of the enlightenment still intact. Uh, but those principles of open, contested discussion, mm. uh, as I referred to earlier, that uh, uh, you know, that Popper enunciated, but. Uh, are also, I also said, uh, and I think it encapsulates it quite well, that, that knowledge advances by, by disagreement mm. um, uh, or um, uh, Richard Feynman, the Nobel Prize winning physicist, who said that uh, one of my favourite quotes was that science is a, a belief in the ignorance of experts. Um, mm. You know, those are a kind of... Um, uh, important kind of aphorisms, and and you're right. I mean, universities. I mean, there are people. I mean, Garth Paltrow, who I mentioned earlier, maintains there are too many people coming out of universities with PhDs. The market can't sustain them, so they're all busily looking for something that will bring employment and research grants and so on and so forth. You, you're preaching um, to the choir there. I'm one of the most uneducated people you've ever come across. I was homeschooled. I went and got a year 10 um, English and math certificate because I needed it to join the army. But yeah. that's the only piece of paper I have. Okay. And I've got to be honest, I am not impressed hmm. when I come across but, PhDs and honours students and so forth from universities. But even you know what they're lacking is that none of them seem to be having as a requirement uh, the study of the history and philosophy of science. Mm. So yeah. most of them, you know, would not know Popper, no. would not know Feynman, mm. you know, would not know what, how they know and whether they know. And these are fundamental aspects. And yeah. it's a failing of, you know, and, and if, they, if anyone came along and voiced contrary views to the, to the accepted, <laughs> accepted wisdom, they'd be, yes. you know, cancelled, labelled a denier, run out of town and so on. And that's why, I mean, I was fortunate to study in... Uh, New Zealand under the, at the University of Otago under a guy called James R. Flynn, mm. who um, um, was a an political ethicist, terrific uh, scholar and teacher. You yeah. know, our honours our honours uh, paper in fourth year, um, we, we read uh, Plato's Parmenides, uh, and in the Parmenides, Plato provides a critique of his own philosophy, of his own epistemology of ethics, and destroys mm. it, anticipating what Aristotle did, you know, subsequently. Yeah, uh, wow. I mean, this 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 was scholarship. This was where we started, you know. Mm -hmm. Civilization began with this kind of uh, example. Yeah. Uh, and Jim wanted to write uh, in, his, in a book, he was a, a socialist, uh, and he was a, an avowed anti-racist. He was, you know, run out of a job, I think, in the, his first job at the University of Eastern Kentucky for supporting racial equality. Um, yeah, right. And uh, he uh, had impeccable credentials on the left, um, but he was a, 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 a scholar of honour and... He wanted to spend about four or five pages in a book on the justification of humane ideals, um, dealing with 
the sort of race and IQ material coming from Arthur mm. Jensen. Yeah. When he looked when he looked at it, he found nothing but ad hominem attacks and people say, "Oh, you, you can't be right. You can't, he's a racist. Don't listen yeah. to him." Yeah. So Jim started researching his own uh, to get his own understanding, to write his own critique uh, of Jensen, and he. I worked on some of this material for briefly when I was unemployed, having finished my thesis. And um, what he found was, you know, he, he spent 20 years of his career uh, becoming a, a leading expert in intelligence testing. And mm. mostly educational psychologists miss something important because they always dealt with standardized data. And this is the example as to why people would say, oh, you know, the people would today who are climate scientists who say, oh, he's not a climate scientist, you know. Mm. But in those days, they would have said, oh, he's not, a, he's not an educational psychologist. But he, he picked up what all of them were missing, which became known as the Flynn effect, which was that people's performance on IQ tests throughout the 20th century improved. Yeah. We got better, better at doing IQ tests. But because yeah. they only dealt with standardized data, standardized to 100, they missed yeah. all of that. Mm. So... Eventually, and he, he sent me a copy of the book, uh, he eventually published his book on the justification of humane ideals after about 20 years. Uh, mm. But before, he died about 18 months ago. And before he died, he published a book. I don't know whether you can see it. I can't quite read. Something about risky to publish free speech and universities. Yeah. A book too risky to publish free speech right. and universities. Yeah. And it is a scathing critique. <laughs> excuse me, of the modern thrust, particularly in North American universities, but it's it's also uh, evident to some extent uh, in Australian and New Zealand universities and, and elsewhere. But the title of the book, book stems from the fact that he had a contract for it with a publisher in the United Kingdom who, once they read the manuscript, got a little nervous, showed it to their lawyers who said, oh, we might get a suit under the Racial Discrimination Act uh, which was tremendously ironic given Jim's uh, background. Uh, and eventually, I mean, I was pleased to say I read the manuscript and also gave him advice and helped, helped get it uh, uh, published. Uh, and I have said that, uh, you know, there are a number of people who gave him comments and I'm, I've never, I've rarely been in, in such distinguished uh, company as those who, uh, who endorsed, who read and endorsed uh, this including Charles Murray and uh, Jonathan Haidt, uh, Thomas Sowell, the great black American uh, uh, thinker. I uh, yes, um, huge Stephen fan Pinkins, of Thomas uh, Sowell. Yeah. Huge and, fan. Uh, you know, so unfortunately, as I say, he passed away. But, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the point, of course, is that we must have free inquiry. Um, this is why you're, you're lying in your work and, and saying, you know, it's it's important. It's fundamentally important. The, the, the right to free speech is the fundamental mm. right. Mm. Um, and it's not just because it's nice for people to be able to speak their mind. Um, it's essential to the functioning of liberal democracies and post-enlightenment um, knowledge. And, um, yeah, you know, one of, one of, he uses one of, I think I've, fed it to him, one of um, um, Mill's quotations where he says that he who knows only his own side of an argument knows nothing of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, it, yeah. it's through the cut and thrust, the play of, of different points of view yeah. uh, that, that knowledge advances. And, uh, you know, the answer, to, it, also, it also has in the, in the uh, front of speech, the answer to the claim is that we must be protected from hate speech. You know, that, uh, if people people feel people feel upset from what they hear. We mustn't say it, which is the biggest load of nonsense going around. Right. But he he quotes uh, George Orwell from the original preface of Animal Farm, which you might have heard. He says, "If liberty means anything at all, it means the right to tell people what they do not want to hear." So, well, there is, I, I don't remember who, who was the origin of this particular quote, uh, but something along the lines of journalism is printing what someone doesn't want you to print. Everything else is public relations. 
Um, and 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 this is this is the truth of it. This is the crux of it. Probably to this day, the most important video that I've ever done was was some eight or nine years ago, called the Forbidden History of Unpopular People. And this was in defence of free speech, at a time when Julia Gillard was a prime minister. The Finkelstein report had just come out. She was proposing to introduce the News Media Council, which was a very much a 1984 Orwellian organisation, where to steal a phrase from Jacinda Ardern. Um, we will be your single source of truth. It was very much that. Uh, and this is this is eight, nine, ten years ago. I don't remember exactly. Uh, and well, I Jacinda, spoke about just, uh, sorry, Jacinda, of course, has a degree in communication, or in other words, public relations. Public she gives relations. Good press, press conferences, but has no idea how to govern. And and look, I am not. I am not prone to conspiracy theories. If you look at my body of work, I spend far more time squashing conspiracy theories than I do actually uh, promoting them. But I do have to mention Jacinda Ardern is a graduate of the World Economic Forum's Young Leaders yeah. School. Yeah. Just saying. Now, I so I, I released this video as the better part of a decade ago with Ignaz Semmelweis, a man who died in an insane asylum, believed to have lost his mind who had actually found a way to save a lot of mothers' lives. Mothers were dying at horrific rates postpartum from infections, and he realised the infections were actually being caused by the doctors. Mothers who gave birth in the gutter, poor women who gave birth in the gutter or at home were dying in, in, in lower rates, fewer were dying than the, than the rich women who made it into the hospital. He understood that there was a problem. He figured out a solution. He didn't have a mechanism to explain why it worked, but he did have data to show that it worked. And he was branded insane and he died in an insane asylum. And it was only some 30, 40 years after his death that uh, microorganisms, germs, etc., were discovered. And all of a sudden they had the mechanism to explain what he was, what he was saying. I mean, so often actual scientific advancement comes from if, if I can put it crassly, it comes from kind of the assholes. It comes from the people that aren't, they're not invited to all the polite parties. They're not welcome in polite society. And yet so often those are the people that actually carry the seeds of wisdom that, that give us that next breakthrough. Yeah. 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 The purple sto fever story is a, is a very powerful one. Mm. Uh, I mean, people wanting to invoke the precautionary principle often, um, Use the example of John Snow, who thought that cholera in London was being spent, uh, spread, uh, spread by uh, um, um, by through the water supply. Mm. So he re removed the pump handle from you know a, a well and uh, then observed that the incidence of cholera uh, declined and so on. Um, which is a nice story, but the I always like to counter by pointing out that the sewering of London, which was the real source of the infection, uh, was conducted pre-germ theory of disease. Yeah. Uh, and so while Snow, you know, was, was right that, you know, the, the water supply was a problem, um, the, um, uh, the theoretical basis for sewering London was on the... Um, uh, God, I've forgotten that. I had it before. Essentially, on on the basis of the smell, mm. they thought they thought that the bad odors, the the miasma theory of disease. Yeah, that, well, that the was the same smell, as the plague. Yeah, yeah. The bad the bad smell was what was causing cholera. Mm. Uh, therefore, we needed to do something to get the sewage away. Uh, the sewage away, and so they they sewered the city of London, and it yeah. happened. Then when Pasteur came along later uh, and they discovered that they'd done the right thing, but for the wrong reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, which again, some, sometimes sometimes happens. Sometimes we get lucky. But then, you, you know, and I use this in my book on um, international risk management. You have to be sensitive to local circumstances. You know, the, the use of chlorine in water supplies um, and, it causes a, an increased incidence of bladder, cancer of the bladder. Of a, I think it's something like 0.3% uh, percent or 0.03%. Is that right? And they, just, and they decided in the United States that this was too high a risk because they're an advanced economy, you know, affluent economy, and 
uh, life expectancy was getting into, into the sort of range where, where bladder cancer might be a problem for you and so on. But then Peru decided that, you know, if the US EPA was concerned about this, they would stop chlorinating their water supply. Yeah. Along came a uh, Chinese freighter, discharged its ballast water into the port in Peru, which got into the groundwater uh, supply of Lima. And um, something like 20,000 people died. Uh, you know, what makes sense in one setting doesn't necessarily make sense in another because yeah. it's that it's that interface between nature and human mm. systems mm. that's important and human behavior mm. um, and there's there's a lot there's a lot of people that get really hung up there, and and this i think is is really sort of almost brings us back to where we started and and what your book did for me was gave me a framework that was non-conspiratorial through which to understand the behavior of people with whom I disagree, people for whom they are making the best decisions that they possibly know how, with all sincerity, to try and get the best possible outcome, and yet they're completely wrong. Uh, you know, for myself, I, I personally like like filtering my water so that the chlorine is is you know minimized in it, but I'm grateful for the fact that the chlorine was there up until it hit my filter. Yes, because yeah. that guarantees that there's a whole bunch of other things that aren't there, yeah. right? You get, you, you, your filter takes out any dead dead bacteria and viruses that the chlorine has already killed for me, right? Yeah, yeah, there there yeah. is a place for a lot of these things without having to go full on conspiracy theory. You know, Alex Jones. You know, now Alex Jones yeah. has regrettably proved to be correct about a few things recently. Uh, he's been incorrect about a lot more things as well over the journey. Um, you know, let's not jump to the full-on conspiracy theory. This mm. virtuous corruption issue. Yeah, uh, stuff, me, stuff up. Stuff up's usually a better, better explanation. Yeah. Well, Occam's razor, yeah. yeah the, the, right. the stuff up, the the honest mistake, um, the I was tired and I just signed off on it and went home early. I mean, this is stuff that people or, assume doesn't happen in science, yeah. but it does. Yeah, or, or uh, a sort of authoritarian impulse masquerading as scientific expertise. Mm. You know, which is, I yeah. think we've seen with seen with COVID. I mean, particularly in Victoria, I'm, I'm looking forward to see, sometimes seeing your your movie because I think the uh, the, the conduct of uh, of uh, Victoria Police was abominable at that time, and I, I've discussed it with some with some senior um, uh, former police senior former senior police in Tasmania, and they they also thought it was pretty terrible. Yeah, so more power to your elbow. Yeah. Well, it is. It's free to watch. Battlegroundmelbourne.com. You can you can watch that. There's no there's no charge there. You don't have to sign up. There's no email address. There's no nothing. You can just literally go to battlegroundmelbourne.com and, and and click play. Well, look, we're 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 heading towards two hours, and and this has been an absolute thrill for me. Um, I'm I'm going to call you professor, even though you've retired. Um, I'm this still is entitled to the title. I'm I'm professor I, emeritus. Yeah, okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. So. Well, I think um, so I, I often point out it's from the Latin meaning e meaning from and without and merit meaning so it means <laughs> with, without merit. Yeah, the the professor without merit. Um, yeah. No, but but this has been a real thrill for me and um, has has absolutely lived up to expectations. I say don't meet your heroes because you're going to get let down. Well, in your case, you've uh, you've absolutely lived up to expectations and, and hopes for what this chat would be. I do thoroughly enjoy your writings in Quadrant Online. And for anyone watching, if you're not a subscriber to Quadrant Online, you need to fix that because there is some incredibly high caliber thought from incredibly high caliber individuals like Professor Ainsley Kello uh, and so many others that goes into that publication online, uh, Quadrant Online, well and truly worth the price of subscription. Um, it becomes freely available after a while, I think. So. It does, yeah, yeah. There's, yeah, a, there's yeah. a period of time where it's exclusive to, to paid members. But honestly, yeah. guys, can we just, as a matter of principle, if you appreciate something, can you just get behind it financially? Because this shit doesn't happen for free. Um, the people behind that have bills to pay. They've got rent. They've got the, everything else. Can we just, as a matter of principle, if you appreciate what someone, if someone is doing, if you appreciate what Quadrant are doing, get behind them financially. IPA, RDA, Turning Point Australia, without exception, if you appreciate what they're doing, just get behind them. Find a way to get behind them. I think that's that's a really good way to um, to make it viable for them to keep doing what they're doing. Anyway, 
Um, I, I want to finish on this question. How do we get from where we are, where an enormous amount of damage has been done in people's trust in science, trust in scientists, etc.? How do we get back? I, I feel like in the 1980s when I was growing up, the 1990s, you could, you felt like you could trust scientists and it was actually true. Now, maybe I was just naive, but I, I feel like it was true back then. You could trust scientists. How do we get back there? I think uh, it's hard to be overly optimistic, to be too sanguine about the possibilities, but I think all that um, uh, we can do in many ways is um, is kind of keep banging the drum for the, the fundamental importance of freedom of inquiry, freedom of speech, of questioning, of dismissing attempts to silence um, um, dissident voices. Um, yeah. That way lies tyranny. I mean, Popper went on for a reason to to write about the open society and its, and, and its uh, enemies. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they go along. Political freedom and scientific freedom go, go hand in hand, really. Mm. Um, I mean, Popper was uh, many things. He started off as a socialist and then, you know, eventually just saw the light of, light of day. I, I, let me tell you an anecdote. He was also uh, a visitor at Otago when I was a graduate student there. Um, he, uh, one of his students, Alan Musgrave, held the chair in philosophy. Um, it was a terrific uh, arts faculty in those days. We had uh, we had not only Jim Flynn, but, but uh, Alan Musgrave, um, Jeremy Waldron, who's now a world's leading jurisprudential scholar at New York University, was there. Um, and um, but uh, but Popper came and visited. Actually, I I held a fellowship. Uh, very much in his shadow, the same fellowship <laughs> some years ago as a visitor as well back there. Um, but Popper, um, Alan Musgrave took Popper to uh, Fieldland to show him a bit of the, the country. And Popper apparently demanded to drive. Uh, and Alan Musgrave said afterwards he'd never been so scared in his life. That Popper just, <laughs> you know, sort of shingle, shingle gravel roads, you know. <laughs> With piles of gravel in the middle and at the edge, and you know, Popper was all over the place. <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, a good experience. I, I mean, the, the thing is that universities um, have to be like that. Have to celebrate difference, mm. people with different uh, different uh, ideas, and mm. people who change their minds. Mm. Um, you know, my university is in the process of wanting to relocate downtown to sort of... Yes, I, I, there's been a hubbub the, around that, yes. Oh, yes, yeah. And, uh, you know, this has been supported by our Chancellor, who, um, I don't know whether she was, knew how ironic she was being, she said when she was a student, university life was, was wonderful at the, at the Sandy Bay campus, she... Uh, could hang around after lectures and talk talk to lecturers and, and tutors, go to the uni bar, go and go to the ref and have coffee and talk to the peers. And of course, none of the social aspect of a university is, is seems to be factored into their plans, mm. and they're trying to move much more. Having found during COVID, I think the convenience of online lectures, they're trying to run more uh, a kind of online. Uh, teaching model and that to me I, I mean I've, I've taught at Deacon for so many years with uh, with distance education but we still provided weekend schools we provided telephone tutorials for groups and so on and I made some good contacts um, and um, you know so I've got a bit of experience with the pros and cons of distance education I don't think they're really on top of what uh, would be required and there's not there's not the sense to it that oh, my my daughter's an arts law student in the final year. Um, they're not proposing to locate the law faculty down near the courts, mm. you know, where, stu where students might wander out between classes and go and order to a trial, mm. and you know soak up something of the law. Um, the only sensible thing that's happened so far and happened some years ago is that the medical schools moved down to co-locate with the hospital. 
Now that's, mm. that's Sentinel. Um, yeah. the, the performing arts are down near the Theatre Royal. But, you know, my area, political science, isn't down anywhere near the Parliament. Yeah. Near the Parliament, yeah. for example, you know. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Look, without getting too deep into sort of state and, and university politics, uh, my time in Tasmania, I've been there, I think, when I went back and thought it through, I think my trip to Tasmania for campaigning at the federal election, I think was my 14th trip to Tasmania. Mm -hmm. So I'm not joking when I say it's a great part of the world. I've been there many times on business and on pleasure. I've done the whole motorcycle thing, doing laps of Tasmania. I have been there uh, for work and for business and catching up with people and, and working with people on projects. I went there actually for my third ever video as TOFA, uh, which was all about bringing water over from Tasmania into, into the mainland uh, and why that would actually fix many of Tasmania's own water issues. Tasmania has droughts. Uh, a lot of the water falls on the mountains in the, in the east and doesn't make it, oh, sorry, in mountains in the west and doesn't make it all the way across to the east. Um, there are things that we could do to fix that, but there's a lack of money and selling money across to the selling water across to the mainland could fix that. Blah blah blah, a whole bunch of things. Tasmania is a simply brilliant part of the world, and I mean that. I I, I really 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 rate my time there, the people that I've met. Um, I, I particularly like the north. I've got to say, Hobart is nice, and everything's very picturesque. Every house has a view almost. Uh, it's very very pretty. Yeah, here we, my, pay premium, here we pay a premium not to have harbour views. <laughs> um, you know, but my people, my people are up around Bernie, you know, mm -hmm. Lonnie to a certain degree, but they're up around, my people yeah. are up around Bernie. These are the people that are, are looking after themselves, growing their own food, um, you know, standing very much on their own two feet. That's, that's mm -hmm. kind of, that's my people. Um, yeah. But as we were talking, we were chatting about pre-show Ainsley, um, you know, my wife and I have made a decision that after the Victorian election. So I'm I'm staying in Victoria until the election. I want that chance to vote against Daniel Andrews, um, and then we're leaving. And uh, I I would love to move to Tassie. There is so much to love about Tassie, but my wife would rather move to Albury. And uh, you're a married man, Ainsley. Uh, you know as well as I do that that means I'm moving to Albury. Uh, <laughs> um, and I don't have very much say in the matter. <laughs> Resistance is futile, Topher. <laughs> Resistance is futile, absolutely. But look, you've you've picked a beautiful part of the world to, uh, to live in and you've been a wonderful guest. I'm so grateful. I'm grateful for the book that you wrote in 2007 that changed my world in 2012. And uh, this, honestly, I, I'm not kidding. Everyone watching, I'm not kidding. This book would be among the top five that I have ever read in terms of its influence on how I think and how I problem solve and how I understand the world around me. I cannot, I cannot overstate the depth of impact that this book had on me. Get it? Get the digital copy if you can't afford the physical copy. Read it. Professor Ainsley Kello has poured an enormous amount of work into this, and it is absolutely worth your time to read. Um, well, thank tonight, you, Tofa. That's that's very generous of you. Um, no, not at all. That's uh, that's it, the it's, truth. It's one. It's one of the best three uh, responses to the book I've had. Someone else said at the time it was published that it had changed their mind, and uh, another person who was, a, in fact, a graduate student working on the Great Barrier Reef, which I hadn't got onto at that stage, so it changed mm. her life. Mm. Uh, so, uh, yeah. It, it, it is. No, and, and you know, you're, you're trying to be to be humble about it, and I, I, I get that. But honestly, it is a profoundly impacting book. And it's had a lasting effect on me to the point that before I even knew that I was going to get the chance to interview you, I was already talking about this book in my interview with Professor Ian Plymer. In my interview with Professor Peter Ridd, I, I, I was talking about this book before I'd actually confirmed that I was even going to get to interview you. This is one of the most profoundly impactful books that I have ever read. And uh, full credit to you, Professor, for, for having authored it. Thank you so much for your time tonight. I'm, I'm deeply grateful. It is always a privilege and an honor uh, to have people of the caliber uh, of yourself willing to spend time with me. So 
Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap up with a couple of minutes worth of comments. Is there any final thought, any any final encouragement? Um, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, young people getting into the sciences, the sciences are a tricky space to be getting into now compared to what it might have been getting into them in, say, the 1980s or, or these sorts of things. Is there any final thought, encouragement that you'd like to leave us with? I suppose just to uh, emphasise, and I've seen some of the comments from uh, from viewers on the bottom of the screen expressing similar sentiments that, um, you know, the important thing is to re is retain uh, scepticism. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the um, uh, I, I read, again, under Jim Flynn, uh, Alfred Ayer's book on language, truth, language, truth, and logic, and Ayer distinguished between different kinds of propositions, uh, empirical propositions, you know, about the real world, uh, uh, moral propositions about what we should do, uh, mm -hmm. analytic propositions, pure mathematics, what's true or false by by definition, sure. and metaphysical ones. Uh, those which uh, are non-falsifiable because they're about you know the afterlife and uh, the Almighty and so on. And um, you know, really, I think part of the problem these days is that the empirical propositions have be become mixed up with the metaphysical and the, and the moral propositions. And we need to uh, learn how to distinguish the two. What we want to be true is not always true. Indeed. Indeed, and and we have to be more committed to the truth than we are to our preconceived ideas, and that's that's easier said than done. Professor, thank you. Tonight has been such a pleasure. Uh, everyone, I, I threw a bunch of links into the comments early on. If you want tickets to the uh, to Battleground Melbourne, we've got about eighty tickets left to the premiere. If you want to come along to CPAC in Sydney, I've got the link in there. If you want to see, um, oh goodness. I've lost his name. Uh, if you want to see, give me one second. Nigel Farage is his name uh, in Melbourne or in Brisbane. He's also in Sydney. You can do that through through um, through Turning Point Australia. Uh, there's too many things in my head. And if you want to be a part of transforming the landscape of the new media in Australia, you need to go to brewaustralia.com and put your email address in there. We'll be in touch. It's about two weeks, about another two weeks. I've got a photo shoot on Monday. We're doing all the lovely photos and videos and stuff of the amazing coffee product. And then we're going to be doing a full sort of formal launch in about two weeks time. Put your email address into brewaustralia.com if you want to be a part of that. Professor, thank you so much. I'll leave you in peace now. It's been two hours. I'm very grateful for your time. And uh, I'm sure. You and, uh, and your uh your viewers and the Calvados has been good. Oh, well, thank you so much. And I'm sure this will not be the last time we speak, uh, but until next time, all the very best. Thank you for watching.